Dr. Mershon, it's a pleasure to have you on QED at Dr. B with us. So this show is about animals and what we as humans can learn from them. So dogs can actually smell or detect cancer through the nose. Is that correct? It is very true. They're to this date the earliest, cheapest, fastest, and most accurate detectors of many diseases, including many cancers. After a few weeks of training done by professionals, these dogs become extremely accurate. It is embarrassing to me to have access to all this fantastic equipment, over $100 million worth of it. Between my and my collaborators, we have all this equipment in our hands, and the trained dog puts us to shame when it comes to cancer diagnosis. It does it better, faster, cheaper, and more accurately. You will see now there's dogs at sporting events and even at airports detecting COVID. The same way that they detect contraband, drugs, uh, foods that are not allowed, etc. And in England, they've shown that they can detect COVID in the wild environment of the airport where there's all those sorts of smells with 99% precision, 0.4 seconds per person. How do they do it? What is happening in their nose or their brain? What's the process that they're able to detect cancer or other diseases? We were actually, for the first maybe half of this project, operating under the wrong assumption. What we thought the dogs were doing in identifying cancer is finding a biomarker. That means finding a specific molecule or set of molecules. However, we found out that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So we're in that level now where we're still not entirely understand, but where the current understanding is that your body scent is sort of like the sand on the beach. Many different sand particles, many colors individually. And then cancer leaves footprints on that body odor that the dogs can pick up on. They're not picking up on any one sand particle. They're not picking up on any one biomarker, any one specific molecule, because different cancers have different volatile ones. That means different volatiles come off of the tissue, but every cancer affects the body in a, it appears to be, at least to the dogs, to be generalizable. That means if you teach the dog to find bladder cancer, we have cases where they generalize automatically with no additional training to let's say breast cancer. Now we know the two tissues are very far apart. As far as we can know, they don't have any identical volatiles. So what we think is happening is the dog can tell the footprints of cancer in your body odor in general without having to depend on specific biomarkers. And in fact, the whole game is to figure out how do you make a machine that is just like the dogs. So let's talk about that. So, so you figured this out by understanding and studying dogs. Transfer that to the technology, the MIT nose, um, and then the future applications for this. We were building the MIT real nose. This is an electronic device that attempts to mimic the dogs. So the technology has two steps. The first step is to detect odorants at very low concentration and high performance. Now, we built all this thinking that we eventually would have to train it molecule by molecule and make it spit out analytical uh, information. But, and in our rush to create this technology, we deployed something else, which had this algorithm where it didn't look for individual molecules, it would just look for patterns. And I thought it was a hack, but it ended up being the hack. In fact, we realized this already works like a nose. It tells us the patterns are the same. It tells us these two things smell the same. And that was enough. In fact, that was the key. So here is a, a clear case where the dogs are teaching the humans. I want to bring that technology to ourselves. What we're doing is we're training an artificial intelligence. The algorithm that we've published can do about the same as the dogs, so in the high 70s. Now, um, it's not enough. It should be 99%. And we know dogs can get there, so the machine has got to get there too before we start deploying it, because we can get there. And we should not accept for anything below 99%. Are you gonna show me some of this technology, correct? Yeah. So walk me through it. Okay, so this is the, the last prototype that we have. So if you look at here, we have four pads. Each of them takes two different receptors. They're, they're protected with gaskets. And then gas comes through here, and it gets analyzed in these eight different sensors. This technology can be shrunk even further, but already, you see, it's still smaller than my entire cell phone. Mm -hmm. And it's actually much thinner than what you see here. All this that you see here already exists in the smartphone. These little things, they're tiny little glass chips. Yeah. And those are like little SIM cards. Now, currently, the most finicky part about this is still the biological component. So the just like your own nose gets replenished every two weeks. Every two weeks you get a new epithelium. So similar to this, it will last for maybe two or three weeks. Then you must take this out, this little SIM card out, mm -hmm. and put it in again. So it's both a, a, a disadvantage and an opportunity. It's an opportunity for business because you can have the razor blade model where you program these little chips biologically, mm -hmm. and you say, today I want to find cancer, tomorrow I want to find a different cancer, I want to find COVID, here, buy the different cartridge that sure. I've created. So you have to put a, keep putting different cartridges in your phone. Mm -hmm. 
My dream is to one day transition from this film-like technology to a digital technology. This does not exist yet. Nobody has figured out how to smell without biology yet or without some kind of chemical sensing yet. But are there any ethical considerations we need to pay attention to? You are constantly leaving behind a trail of molecules that tells me everything about you. If I really take this all the way, then I would be able to point my phone at you. I'd have to put it pretty close, but I'd be able to know, let's say, if, if you're pregnant, what sex you're carrying, what you've smoked, eaten, or drank, who you've been around. These are very, very potent pieces of information that you might not want to share with me, with anybody, any random stranger. Also, you might not trust the machine that collects this data about you and have it in your pocket all day long, and then some dark conglomerate enterprise is mining your data and making a lot of money. If we don't get ahead of this, there is a risk that this technology will never come to us because people are already very sensitized about being filmed, about being recorded for their audio. Now I'm telling you, oh, I also want to record your smells. That sounds like a huge violation of privacy, right? Unless you can trust this technology, you will not want to buy that phone. And if you don't want to buy that phone, no company is going to make that phone. So we, 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 we're trying to find this space where companies can make money and humans can be protected. Thank you for having us in your MIT lab. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>